This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On October 8th, as part of his personal contribution to the commemoration of World War I, the RCMI's honorary historian Jack Granitstein addressed our regular military history night on the topic, The Greatest Victory, Canada's Hundred Days of 1918. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be in the new RCMI, which frankly looks wonderful. And I'm happy to note that the food is better than it used to be in the old RCMI. <laughs> it's now almost 20 years ago that I wrote a little book called Who Killed Canadian History? At the same time, I went to the Canadian War Museum as the director and CEO for a two-year term. In Who Killed Canadian History, I lamented how little Canadians seemed to know about their past, not least their military past. The Dominion Institute at that time, it no longer exists, was doing opinion surveys that showed that Canadians, and students especially, knew almost nothing about Canada's past and nothing about World War I or World War II. Most of them couldn't identify who the Allies were in either war. They didn't know who Mackenzie King was, and they thought Vimy was in Asia. At the War Museum, it was only a little bit better. It was in a state of complete physical and historical decay, located in the former National Archives building on Sussex Drive. I, I, when I went to the War Museum, it was, it was a condition of my taking the job that I could hire three good historians, and I got three very good people. And the first task they had was to go through the museum and count the errors, and they produced a 35-page memorandum of mistakes that we set about fixing. Twenty years later, what's changed? There's a new Canadian War Museum that is, I think, splendid. I can say that because I didn't have anything to do with building it. It's arguably the best museum in the country. It's the only one at the moment that covers Canadian history in a chronological, historically sound fashion. But does anyone know Canadian history any better than they did when Who Killed Canadian History came out? I'm going to get some idea of this, I think. My granddaughter is in grade 10 at Riverdale Collegiate, and she is taking the one compulsory course in Canadian history that high school students have to take. It covers 20th century Canada. In the centenary year of the Great War, as a special treat, I take it, the English course is meshing with the history course and they're all studying war as a phenomenon and war as it affected Canada. So I think there might actually be a chance that a grade 10 student who's not really interested in history, notwithstanding her grandfather, might, might learn something about this country and part of its past. Certainly there's a lot of material in the newspapers on World War I. The centenary has generated a very substantial amount of coverage. But when I look at it, it seems to me that all it is is Vimy, Vimy, Vimy. Vimy all the time. Now, Vimy, of course, is where the great Canadian War Memorial stands, and it's a stunning sight. This man, <coughs> Sir Arthur Curry, didn't want it to be at Vimy. He thought Vimy was not the most important battle the Canadians fought, and he thought there might be better places. He lost that argument. He was right, however, that Vimy was not the most important of Canada's battles in the Great War. It was important. Vimy was a major Allied victory at a time when there weren't many victories. It was the first time that all four Canadian divisions fought together. And they took on a heavily defended German position as part of the larger British offensive 
on the Arras sector. The Canadian Corps was commanded not by Curry at that point, but by General Julian Bing, a British officer. Curry was the commander of the 1st Division. He contributed to the plan, but it was Bing's plan. In fact, it was a British plan. The staff working under Bing was almost entirely British. The Canadian Corps in April 1917, at the time of Vimy, was more than 60% made up of men born in Great Britain who had immigrated to Canada. Most important, Vimy didn't win the war, Canadian mythology notwithstanding. It didn't speed the German defeat. It didn't do anything except move the German front lines back a few miles towards the city of Lens. It was great for Canadian morale at the front. The Canadians, the Canadians after Vimy thought they could do anything, and in fact, they could. It was great for Canadian morale at home. It made the Canadian Corps into an elite formation, but its overall effect on the war was minimal. But the Canadians did play a decisive role in the Great War, in the last hundred days of that war. From August the 8th, 1918, to the armistice of November 11th, the Canadian Corps played the greatest role any Canadian army has ever accomplished in any war we have participated in. But Canadians know almost nothing of this. Vimy has driven out mention of everything else. Vimy has destroyed the memory of the Hundred Days. Moreover, unlike at Vimy, during the Hundred Days, the Canadian Corps was commanded by a Canadian, Arthur Curry. It was staffed by Canadians. And by October 1918, for the first time, Canadian-born men made up a majority of the Canadian Corps. The Hundred Days began at Amiens in France on August the 8th. The Canadian Corps had already established a reputation as an elite force. The Germans knew this. And if the Germans saw the Canadians coming into the front line, they expected an attack. So the Canadian Corps, which had been based up near Arras, secretly moved to Amiens before August the 8th, in a few days before August the 8th. Moving 100,000 men, trucks, horses, artillery, supplies, in secret, was an extraordinary logistical feat. And it worked. The Canadian presence at Amiens came as a sudden shock to the Germans on August the 8th. The Canadians, the Australians, the British, the French off to the right flank, smashed the German line and advanced eight miles on the first day of battle. Eight miles in World War I terms was an extraordinary victory. It literally had not been done at all by the Allies to that point. General Ludendorff, the quartermaster general, the chief planner of the German army, called it the black day of the German army in the war. And he was right. It marked the beginning of the end for the German army in World War I. The Canadians weren't finished. After Amiens, they moved back to the Arras area. And there they faced the strongest part of the German defenses. The Drocourt Keant switch, it was called, a part of the Hindenburg line, which was the major German defenses along the Western Front. Beginning at the end of August and into the first days of September, the Canadian Corps broke through this line at very heavy cost. Later in September, after recovering, after filling up their ranks again, the Canadians took on the Canal du Nord, a partially completed canal running through northern France. It was arguably the greatest Canadian battle ever, and it was certainly Curry's 
battle masterpiece. After the Canal du Nord came the liberation of the city of Cambrai, the center of the German uh, supply lines and the crossroads for rail and road in northern France. Canadians took it on 9 October. I might point out that across the hall here, in the small dining room behind the, the uh, lovely wine cellar, there are some World War I lithographs, including a marvelous one of the liberation of Cambrai, showing Canadians moving through the rubble of the city. It's quite extraordinary. After Cambrai, liberated on October the 9th, the Canadians took the city of Valenciennes on November the 1st, and then followed the pursuit to Mons, where the war ended on November the 11th. This is the pinnacle of Canadian art, the story of our greatest succession of victories under our greatest commander, Curry, and the greatest fighting force the country ever put in the field. But why? Why was it that the Canadian Corps was as successful as it was? There's a whole host of reasons, and I, that's really what I want to talk about tonight. First thing is that the Corps' four divisions stayed together and fought together. They fought as one. During the uh, German offensive in the spring of 1918, a division or two was sometimes moved out of the Canadian Corps to help shore up the British line. But Curry worked to get them back as quickly as he could, and the Canadian Corps, as he said, fought better when it was together, when it was under Canadian command. He was not wholly modest, but he didn't say under my command, he meant. That's what he meant, really. The Corps, moreover, unlike most of the British divisions that served with in the British Expeditionary Force, was at full strength at the beginning of the Hundred Days and through a good part of it. It had a reinforcement stream that worked, and it had conscripts arriving from Canada and England in substantial numbers throughout the Hundred Days. Up to 65% of the reinforcements in some of the infantry battalions were conscripts, men who'd been called up in January 1918, given some training in Canada, given more in England, and then put in the front line battalions. The first conscripts arrived in France in May. The first conscripts were killed in June. By November, more of them would be killed. There were 24,000 conscripts. That was the equivalent of more than a division's worth of, of men, and it made a huge difference in keeping the Canadian battalions up to strength. Curry, in fact, was able to add 100 men to the establishment of each of the 48 battalions in the four divisions of the Canadian Corps. So in, in addition to having their full strength of just under 1,000, he added an extra 100 men. He got them from the 5th Division, the 5th Canadian Division, which had sat in England for the last couple of years, commanded by Sam Hughes' son, Garnet Hughes. Sam Hughes and Curry weren't exactly friendly. I'll say some more about this. But the main reason for their difficulties was that Garnet Hughes, Sam's son, wasn't allowed by Curry to have a division command in the field. In Curry's view, he wasn't competent. Curry was a man of some principle and resisted putting incompetence, patronage appointments in command. Curry had also refused to do what the British were doing. The Brits were short of men, and so they reduced their brigades from four battalions to three. The Canadians continued to have four battalions in their brigades, and as a result, the extra hundred men, they had 50% more infantry in each of their divisions than the British did. That made a huge difference. The Canadian Corps also had more artillery. The 5th Division had a full complement of artillery regiments. Curry had kept them together, added them to the artillery of his four divisions, and in effect had 
the artillery of a small British field army at his command. And the commander of Canadian, the commander of Corps Royal Artillery, the chief artillery officer, could centrally direct the artillery. You could put the fire of a division or two divisions or three or the entire Corps artillery on a single point on the order of one man. British Corps couldn't do this. Canadians also used more gas than anybody else on the Western Front. Canadians, we like to think of us as pure, Canadians gassed everything that moved whenever they could. They also had more engineers. Curry believed that engineers were the key to the battlefield. And he put together engineer brigades of three battalions plus a bridging section in each one of the four divisions. And he had other specialized units. And he made sure that the engineers had enough men that they could do the work that had to be done without, as they had done up till Curry's time, without calling on infantry, poor bloody tired infantry, to do the work. The engineers could do the work with their own complement of troops. Fourth point and critical, the Canadians had more machine guns. They had a machine gun battalion of 96 guns in each division and more men to man these guns. The Canadians were increasing their machine gun strength through the 100 days, through 1918, while the British were reducing theirs. The Canadians had one machine gun for every 13 men. The Brits had one machine gun for every 61 men. Uh, for comparison's purpose, to suggest how important the machine gun was, in 1914, when the first contingent went overseas, there was two machine guns for each battalion. In 1915, there was four. By 1918, we have a machine gun for every 13 men. The Canadian Corps also had more trucks. It had 100 more trucks than a British Corps. And Curry, smart man that he was, decided that drivers had to work very hard over the rough French roads and unload their, their cargo when they got where they were going. And so he insisted that drivers have a, have a, a category medical profile. He didn't want to use low category men as his drivers. And he was right. And the Canadian Corps had the best logistics of any corps in the British Expeditionary Force. We also had a motor machine gun brigade heavy machine guns mounted on vehicles with a light armor. There's one of the motor machine gun vehicles on display in the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. The only surviving one anywhere, I believe. And these vehicles could provide indirect fire. In other words, they could shoot at a map reference aiming at a crossroads to deny its use to the enemy. They could do reconnaissance and they were mobile. They could move where they were needed. And in the advance after the Canal du Nord, the machine gun brigade quite often led the advance, scouting out ahead of uh, looking for where the Germans had their positions. And as I mentioned, by 100 days, the Canadian Corps' staff was almost entirely Canadian. Every division and the Corps headquarters was manned by Canadians. The staff planners who had spent weeks preparing the 12 inch thick tactical and, and administrative orders for the attack on Vibby in April 1917 now were skilled enough to devise complicated plans in days and to do so without the paper burden that had previously been necessary. Morris Pope who was a Lieutenant General in the Second World War, was a major in World War I, a staff officer at 4th Canadian Division. And he noted in September 1918 that Vimy had taken months of preparation. Four days ago, he said, of the attack on the Drocourt-Quéant line, 
Four days ago, I knew nothing of this affair, and the job is at the very least of equal magnitude. The planners interpreted the intelligence reports, then they prepared their plans to fit what they knew, what the Allied High Command wanted, and what Curry's Corps Headquarters wanted for the overall attack. They would lay down the tasks for each of the Corps' four divisions. And at the division, the plans were adjusted to fit each of the brigades. And the brigade staff would pass the orders down to battalions. At Amiens, for example, the 1st Canadian Infantry Brigade issued a two-page order for its troops. In a matter of hours, by 1918, Curry's orders could reach private blogs in the 3rd Platoon of C Company of the Umpty Umpt Battalion in a simple form, likely accompanied now by air photographs that, and certainly by maps that would show where the German positions were and what the objective was. The Canadian Corps, its commanders, its staff, its soldiers were now a skilled, experienced team. Most of them, except for a few very senior planners, were Canadians, men who had learned their jobs by watching British Army professionals at Corps, Division and Brigade headquarters and by taking staff courses. You also had very able, very young battalion commanders. In effect, after four years of war, these men had survived fire and death, death all around them, not their own, and they were professional soldiers in everything but name by 1918. And they had a battle doctrine. The Corps had trained since May 1918 for open warfare. How to use tanks, artillery, and the air to support their attacks. Artillery was to be accurate and tense, and then quick attacks would go through soft spots in the enemy line. The troops would advance using infiltration, fire and movement, supported by armor, supported by air. At Amiens, the infantry battalions attacked on a wide front of a thousand yards, double that that had been used at Vimy. The main body of men were preceded by sections of skirmishers, or scouts, who located the enemy strong points, then pointed them out to the tanks to eliminate them, so the men could filter through the enemy line rather than taking them all on at once. If resistance could not be evaded, half the platoon would employ fire and movement using its Lewis machine gun for protection, sometimes fired from the hip, while the other half of the platoon used rifle grenades and rifle fire to cover the troops that were advancing. Where necessary, artillery support could be whist whistled up, or tanks could be called up to take out serious resistance. Moreover, commanders now had orders not to worry about their flanks, but to continue to advance, contrary to the earlier doctrine that had prevailed. And commanders now were to go forward with their troops, not to wait back. They were to go forward so they could adapt and be flexible and seize opportunities. Speed was the essence of the new doctrine. And the artillery barrage at Amiens, for example, moved at a pace of 100 yards every two minutes and was not preceded by a counter-battery campaign that aimed to take out German guns before the attack. You wanted to have surprise. A year earlier, at Passchendaele, for example, the barrage had moved 100 yards every eight minutes. So you'd speed it up things dramatically. It wasn't just the mud that was holding people back at Passchendaele, it was doctrine. By 1918, the doctrine had adapted. In effect, the Canadian Corps, to use Shane Schreiber's phrase, became the shock troops of the British Empire. Well, why? Why were the Canadians used as shock troops? First, and most important, 
because the Corps was an excellent, well-led formation with a great deal of punch and a terrific record of success. That mattered enormously. Second, Curry wanted his Corps to do the big things, to fight and win the big battles. Canadian nationalism had burgeoned during the war. I said that the Canadian Corps was made up mainly of British-born immigrants to Canada. By 1918, they were Canadians. They'd become Canadians at the front in every way. Canadian nationalism had grown, burgeoned during the war, and it was very powerful. Prime Minister Borden understood that, Curry understood that, and a different, stronger Canada had to emerge and did from the war. Third, the Canadian Corps was at or near full strength, and the reinforcements came forward in a steady stream. The final point is somewhat less palatable. British casualties in the four years of the war had been terrible. There had been catastrophes like the Somme and Passchendaele that had swallowed men in the tens of thousands, in the hundreds of thousands. The politicians in London inevitably felt the heat. And Field Marshal Douglas Haig at the headquarters of the British Expeditionary Force came to understand that repetitions of the slaughter of the Somme and Passchendaele would mean his head. No more slaughter for no discernible gains. The reality is that Canadian casualties mattered much less to London and much less to Hague. They were a Canadian political problem, not a British one, not David Lloyd George's, not Field Marshal Hague's. I'm not, I don't want to make too much of this. It wasn't the Canadians being slaughtered at British orders. But it was the unpleasant reality that Canadian casualties mattered less than British. Thus it was the Canadian Corps that would tackle the Drocker Kayant line and the Canal du Nord and Cambrai and suffer the casualties in doing so. But above all, what made the Canadian Corps great was this man. He didn't like that portrait, incidentally. He thought it made him look uh, sort of nervous and weak. Curry was not loved by his troops, perhaps because he was a shy man. I think he probably had a slightly squeaky voice, although I have to admit I've never heard Curry speak. He was fat. He was pear-shaped. He didn't look like the beau ideal of a soldier. He was, as I said, unloved by Sam Hughes, who had been the Minister of Militia and Defense to the end of 1916, and who remained an MP thereafter. He also, Curry also, had a past. He was a Victoria, British Columbia property speculator and a militia officer before the war. There was a crash in 1913. Get ready, we're going to see it again. And property that Curry owned that was suddenly very valuable, suddenly that had been very valuable, suddenly was almost worthless. And he was on the verge of going bust. He was the commanding officer of a new Highland regiment, and the government had provided $10,000, the equivalent of a quarter million dollars in today's terms, for kilts and sporans and skandus and all the apparatus a Highland regiment seems to need. And Curry, on the verge of going overseas in 1914, stole the money not to put too fine a point on. He stole the money to pay off his debts. That hung over his head into 1918 until his debt was paid off by some rich senior officers in the Canadian Corps. But having said that Curry stole money to save his own position, let me say at once that he was a man of the highest principle and great moral courage. He refused, as I said, to get, give Sam Hughes' son a command that he could not handle. He simply wasn't capable of doing the job. So Hughes sat out the war commanding the 5th Canadian Division in England. Curry believed in a meritocracy. You had to earn your positions by 
serving well on the battlefield. And he resisted patronage. He wanted his soldiers to survive, and he wouldn't have incompetent commanders. Now, he earned his way forward. He was appointed a brigade commander in August 1914 by Sam Hughes. And he took the brigade overseas, and he did well with it at Ypres in April 1915, when the Canadians faced the Germans' first major gas attack. He made one foolish error. He left his headquarters, his brigade headquarters, to go to the rear to seek out reinforcements in the midst of the battle. That was something that he ought not to have done, though he brought up some 300 reinforcements. He did well enough that when the Canadian Corps was formed late in 1915, Curry was made commander of the 1st Division. And when Bing took over in 1960, Curry impressed Bing enough that when Bing was promoted after Vimy to an army command, Curry was his choice, the British Expeditionary Forces choice, the government's choice in Ottawa for Corps commander. He got the job because he had demonstrated that he could fight and win and learn and change tactics as necessary. He would adapt to meet conditions on the front. He certainly played a substantial role in shaping the Canadian Corps' reorganization that took place before Vimy. And he played a substantial role in applying the lessons the French had learned to how the Canadian Corps fought at Vimy. And in June 1917, he becomes the Corps commander. Almost at once, he shows his courage, his guts. The British wanted him, wanted his Canadian Corps to take the town of Lens, an industrial coal and steel town in northern France. Curry disagreed. He didn't want to take the town. There was no point in running his troops through the streets in a costly house-clearing operation. Instead, he suggested they take the two hills that controlled visibility over the town. Hill 70 was one of them. If the Canadians took those hills and reinforced themselves quickly and well, the Germans would be compelled to attack, to take them back, and the Canadians would be ready for them. German doctrine said, counterattack at once. Canadian doctrine said, beat the hell out of them when they try to do that. Curry was right. And the Canadians atop the two hills at, Hill, at Lens destroyed some three divisions of German troops who engaged in futile counterattack after counterattack. He did this again in September 1918 at the Canal du Nord. He wanted to send his whole corps, four divisions, through a narrow, dry section of the canal. The canal was unfinished. There was one section that had not been completed and it was not underwater. The rest of the canal had steep banks, deep water. It would be a suicidal trap for troops. But Curry's plan to use that dry section was risky. If the Germans discovered the concentration of Canadian troops on their bank of the canal, they could shell it, they could gas it, they could cause incredible havoc while it was trying to get ready to go across. Curry's army commander, General Horn, was worried about this. General Haig was worried about this. And they actually sent Bing, General Bing, Curry's friend and former corps commander, to try to persuade him not to do this. Curry basically said his plan would work, and he stuck to his guns, and Bing said, if it doesn't, old man, you're for home. In other words, you'll be fired. Curry nonetheless persisted. And he was right. He had the courage to carry out his plans. And he also used the fact that he was a national army commander to keep his Canadians together as much as possible. He wasn't just a corps commander in the British Expeditionary Force. He was the Canadian commander at the front, the same position 
that General Crerar would have in World War II. He had extra authority that he could use to resist British efforts to reorganize his corps and make it adapt to the three battalions per brigade. He could even argue against a British suggestion, it was more than a suggestion, that he split the Canadian Corps into two corps and become a Canadian army, which would mean that Curry, who was a lieutenant general, a three-star, would become a full general, a four-star position. He didn't care about the promotion. He argued that the Canadian Corps was a good formation as it stood, that if it split in two, it wouldn't have any more teeth and would have a lot more tail. It would have a bigger staff, it would have more headquarters, it wouldn't do anything. It's a lesson NDHQ ought to learn. And though few ever mention it, Curry was absolutely ruthless. He was a man who had a ruthless desire for victory. He put it himself in an, an address in Toronto in 1919. We were counterattacked by eight German divisions on October the 1st, 1918, he said, two of which were fresh. Do you realize that meant 50 or 60,000 Germans, all quite willing to die, coming right at us, determined to kill everyone? And we were determined that we would kill every one of them rather than let them get through. On that day, we fired 7,000 tons of ammunition. No wonder the ammunition factories of Canada were kept busy. It was fired to kill, he said. If they got close to us and escaped the artillery, we tried to shoot them with rifles, kill them with machine guns. If they came on, as they were quite willing to do, we were ready to stick the bayonet into them. I want you to understand what war is, and you cannot have war without the inevitable price. In that same speech, he said, we believe that the only way to win wars was by fighting, so we prepared attacks on every front. We tried to make the German's life miserable. We gassed him on every opportunity, and on one occasion, 90% of the gas in France was being thrown at the Bosch by the Canadians. We never forgot that gas at Ypres, and we never let him forget it either. We gassed him on every conceivable occasion, and if we could have killed the whole German army by gas, we would gladly have done so. This is a tough man. Now, his troops suffered very heavy casualties. The overall Canadian toll in the Great War was 68,656 dead and 176,380 wounded or injured for a total of something over 245,000. The death roll included 51,700 members of the CEF killed in action or died of wounds and 7,800 who died of disease. In all, 422,000 men and 2,400 women, almost all nursing sisters, served overseas. Some of them were in England and didn't get to France at all. In other words, to get overseas and to get to France was to have a 58% chance of being killed or wounded. If you deduct the number who never left England, and it's fairly substantial, the percentage is even higher. To carry this further, since at least 8 in 10 of the casualties fell on the infantry, their chances of surviving the war without being killed or wounded were minuscule. And most of those killed died in ways that Sar Battery Sergeant Major Brooke Claxton, a later Minister of National Defense in the Saint Laurent government said, most of those men died a mean, mechanical, drab death. There was no heat of battle or any of the storybook stuff, just horribly inhuman. Now in the hundred days from August the 8th until the armistice on November the 11th, 1918, the Canadian Corps sustained 45,800 casualties. Men killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. That's almost 20% of the total casualties 
in the four years of war. Almost one in five of the Canadians killed and wounded in the Great War died or were wounded in the last hundred days of battle. A staggering testimony to the fierceness of the fighting the Corps engaged in from Amiens to the Drocourt Quayant line, from the Canal du Nord to Cambrai and Valenciennes and on to Mons. The most men who died on a single day were 960 killed on September the 1st. The total casualties, as always falling mostly on the infantry, almost equaled the roughly 48,000 men who made up the 48 infantry battalions of the Canadian Corps when they were at their full strength. For comparative purposes, the losses in the 100 days were greater than the casualties 1st Canadian Army sustained in Northwest Europe in the 11 months from D-Day to VE Day. The last months of the Great War, in other words, were no walkover, no chasing a beaten enemy out of France and Belgium. And the casualties from fighting in open warfare rather than the trenches were as high or higher than any of the battles preceding the Hundred Days. But as historian Bill Rawling correctly observed, only the ratio between losses and gains changed. Costly victories, he said, were better than costly defeats. Much better. Curry had no illusions about the horrors of war. In that same address in Toronto in August 1919, he stated that we picture war as a business of banners flying, men smiling, full of animation, guns belching force, forth, and all that sort of thing. One somehow or other gets the impression that there is a great deal of glory and glamour about the battlefield. I never saw any of it, he said. I want you to understand that war is simply the curse of butchery, and men who have gone through it, who have seen war stripped of all its trappings, are the last men that will want to see another war. Curry understood what he and his soldiers had gone through. Against the casualties, against the loss, against the suffering, Curry and his Canadian Corps could set the Corps' extraordinary achievements. General Horn, the army commander that Curry served under, actually told Curry, and I'm quoting, the Canadian Corps is perhaps rather apt to take all the credit it can for everything and to consider that the British Expeditionary Force consists of the Canadian Corps and some other troops. There was some truth in that. Curry, not a braggart, but he did write in one letter to a friend that we took care of 25% of the total German army on the Western Front. All are part of 47 divisions. Leaving it, and I'm quoting him here, leaving it to the American army, the French army, the Belgian army, and the rest of the British army to look after the balance. Curry, of course, knew that some people looked on him as a butcher, that he'd sacrificed men in an effort to win glory for himself. He knew that some of his own soldiers shared that opinion. He must have been thinking of the need to make a counter-argument. But in fact, the Corps' brilliant record required no justification, nor did Curry. He knew that to beat what historian Colonel Jack English called a determined first-class enemy on a decisive front called for hard pounding. And Curry knew that loss of life was essential to winning the victory. But he was a careful general. He did not waste his soldiers' lives. Curry was not Haig, who threw away men in their thousands for no discernible gain. Curry was a great general. He didn't look the part, but he is the greatest Canadian soldier of all time. And it's a pity that more Canadians don't know enough about him. He was a great man. He may have stolen money, but he did his country enormous service. Thank you very much.
Now, I'll be happy to try to answer questions, but there's no mics in the audience. So if you're going to ask a question, please yell. Stand up, please, as well. Questions? Sure. Yes, I did know that Strathroy, Ontario has erected a monument. Curry was born in a, in a hamlet nearby Greater Strathroy, I guess. And I haven't seen the statue, I've seen pictures of it. I was actually invited to speak at the opening and couldn't make it. Sir. What are the three things, 100 years later, that we need to know and learn about the last 100 days for application today, both for our military, but more importantly for our nation? Well, you need good leaders. And good leaders aren't found when you suddenly go to war. You have to train your leaders. We should have learned that from the First World War when we started out with nothing. We should have learned it from the Second World War when we started out with nothing. And there's large piles of dead Canadians because we had to learn on the job. First point is you need good people. Second, you need good equipment. By the 100 days, the Canadian Corps had everything that modern war required. It had good artillery, tanks, aircraft in support, good infantry who were well equipped and they'd learn how to do the job. Third thing, you need doctrine. You need a way of proceeding to fight your battles. I think we have doctrine now. Um, what we don't have are the, is the equipment to do the job. I hope we have the good leaders. We had the chance to train good people in Afghanistan in difficult circumstances, and some good people rose quickly through the ranks. Uh, let's hope we don't have to use them, but if we do, I want good leaders, good people with good doctrine, and the right equipment. We don't have the most important one, which is the equipment at this point. Sir? You. Yes, sir. Uh, the carnage on both the eastern and western fronts is so great that many ships actually rebelled in many armies. The Russian army gave up, the French army had a mutiny. The German army in uh, 1918 started to surrender in droves. Uh, they just uh, had too much. And yet I've never heard of any like that in the Canadian Corps, or even the British Army either, actually. So how did they manage to maintain morale despite this horrendous losses in the last 100 days? They did have their problems in the last 100 days. Uh, there were some units that were pretty balky about continuing to fight into November because there were strong rumors that the Germans were about to surrender. Um, why should I get killed when the war is about to end? And as you'll probably know, one Canadian soldier was killed two minutes before the armistice in Mons. Um, so there's a bit of that. But most of the Canadian troubles came after the armistice. Uh, we want to go home, thank you very much. What's the delay? Why can't we go home now? Why is Joe, who got here two years after I did, why is he going home before me? And there were terrific riots in England around Aldershot, and the town was sacked by Canadian soldiers. Uh, some people were killed, there were many wounded, there were people arrested, court-martialed, jailed for long terms. And in fact, they did get home earlier as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, curiously, the same thing happened in World War II at the same place. And even more curious, mm -hmm. the general who had to go and deal with the problem in 1945 was the son of the man who had to go deal with the problem in 1918. <laughs> so sometimes what goes around comes around. Uh, but it was, Canadian, the Canadians had a reputation for ill discipline. We had the highest rate of VD among British Commonwealth Army. We had, uh, we had a lo lot of disciplinary problems. We weren't quite as well disciplined or as orderly as the Brits. Um, we fought better than the Brits most of the time. There were very good British corps, there were very good British divisions, but sometimes, sometimes, the Canadians went a little uh, rambunctious. Sir? Uh, do you feel looking as a historian at the comparison between the Canadians and the British at that time, during the latter half of the First War, that the Canadians were better at fighting 
as individuals, I mean, individuals, I mean like battalion commanders, lieutenants, if you cut them off, were they better at it because they tended to be individualistic a bit more than, which has been said by some people, than the British Army that did what they were told, and if you didn't tell them what to do, they weren't too sure what to do. The Canadians had a reputation for being able to operate like that. Would you say that was correct? I think there's some truth in that. The, the line used to be that the Canadians were more individualistic than the British, but less so than the Americans. We were somewhere in the middle. We had a little more sense of order and discipline than the Americans, a little less than the British. Um, I'm not sure stereotypes really fit. I think there were good battalion commanders who could seize the initiative. There were good sergeants who could take over when all their officers were killed. That's probably true in any army. What the point is, is that the Canadians fought well. They knew they were well commanded. They knew that their generals weren't trying to throw them away. They knew that their objectives were attainable if people did their job. They were well briefed, they were well trained, they had the good equipment, and they could do it. And that happened repeatedly after Vimy onwards. Didn't happen before. You can't take an army and suddenly make it great. It takes time, it takes losses, it takes learning. And the Canadian Corps was genuinely a learning institution. The lessons from Battle 1 were applied to Battle 2, and the lessons from 1 and 2 were applied to 3. You tried to learn how to deal with the problems on the battlefield, and they were horrendous. No army successfully mastered trench warfare till the Germans did. The Germans really were the first in the spring of 1918. They developed the infiltration tactics that the Canadians then applied and used against them in the Hundred Days. That's initiative, that's learning, that's seizing what works and applying it to the problems you faced. And it worked. Sir? Um, I read somewhere that, uh, like George, 19, was considering uh, taking Curry and Morash, you know, the Australian, and giving them the British Expeditionary Force. I don't think there's the slightest bit of truth in that. There's no way that, that any British Prime Minister would allow a bloody colonial to do that job. I think the British Army would, but I've read that somewhere. Well, Lloyd George said it. But Lloyd George hated Haig, and in his memoirs, which came out in the 1930s, he set out to knock down whatever was left of Haig's reputation. So he said, you know, oh, we'll put, put a Canadian in charge. Fat chance. That's not to say that Curry couldn't have done the job. No, I'm just saying that. I was thinking just that he wouldn't get it. Yeah. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, I come from uh, he was incarcerated in Epsom. The Canadians came from Archstone and Epsom. And some of the bobbies, black car that occurred, Barry police. But there were any times after a conflict, getting big problem. I think it was mainly a shortage of shipping. There weren't enough ships to take people home. And there was a, a giant flu epidemic raging through the world. And that put a damper on, on everybody's ability to, to move. And the combination of those things, plus the pressure from the Americans to get their people back home, uh, it simply meant there weren't enough ships. But once the Canadians got unhappy and rioted, then suddenly shipping seemed to become available in rather more, <laughs> in rather larger quantities. So there may be a moral there. Sure. Um, I, I'm fascinated uh, to, to, to hear you to say about sort of the, the, the British role in, in selecting Arthur Curry as, as, as a commander. You know, in, in the current context, we see generals that, that go off to, to Texas or, or California or the U.S. Uh, training centers. That, that's how they get selected to be chiefs of defense staff in Canada today. That until until the general officer has a nod from a from a foreign power, we don't really promote anybody. And it, it's, it's sort of an interesting expression of, of something that continues today. And I'd, I'd just like to, to hear your thoughts on on how the the role that Ottawa played for Arthur Curry, if it played such a role, set the conditions for for the culture of Ottawa's influence in, in operations today. It's hmm. a good question. Um, I don't think Ottawa had much role at all in the first war. Um, we were a colony. We had a different status then than now. Colonies do what they're told. On the other hand, as Borden said, 
you can't expect us to put half a million men into the field and simply do whatever you tell us. You have to give us some say in things. But that didn't extend very much to deciding who would command the Canadian Corps. There was another contender, General Turner, who was senior to Curry and who was in charge of the Canadians in England. He thought he was entitled to the Canadian Corps. And that's one place where the politicians came into play. And the key factor probably there was certainly British desire for Curry. He'd been at the front, Turner hadn't since 1915, 1960. But the cabinet minister who was based in London, we had a cabinet minister in London during the war, argued for Curry. And that was a political choice as well as a military choice. Now today, I don't, I don't think you must have American service to become Chief of the Defense Staff. Lawson, the current CDS, Air Force, doesn't have that. Um, I think it's, it's a great help, obviously, for someone to train with, with a, an American Corps or a, an American division because we can't put those things in the field. But I don't think it's essential to rise. I think bureaucratic skill is more important than military skill. It always was, it always will be. Yeah, Eric. Uh, moving forward a hundred years, uh, we say Iraq, some of us say Iraq, but how do we convince airstrike uh, does it take effect hours? Uh, it's failed. You can't. The Evan Solomons will not be persuaded. Um, we do a very poor job of explaining the effects the military can bring to a battlefield to our people. Canadians somehow assume that every Canadian soldier has a field marshal's baton in his backpack. They somehow assume that we're really only peacekeepers, that we've never shot anybody in a war. That's why I like to talk about Curry's ruthlessness, because it should remind Canadians that Canadians had a reputation as tough, brutal, ruthless soldiers. Um, that's still there. I think that was demonstrated to some extent in Afghanistan. If, heaven forbid, we have to put ground troops into Iraq or Syria, it'll probably be demonstrated again. But the Canadian public won't like that. And it will require great efforts to explain to Canadians what's involved. I mean, we need to quote Curry's arguments that war is brutal, bloody, and awful. You don't commit yourself to it without serious consideration. But if you have to do it, you need a tough, ruthless commander to set the terms. Otherwise, you lose. Sure. You mentioned that uh, Curry was against the Vimy Memorial. Yeah, and you being at Vimy. At Vimy. And you implied all along that the 100 days should be celebrated perhaps even more than what we do about Vinny. Could you expound on that a little bit? Curry believed that his greatest victories came in the Hundred Days. That was where he was at his very best. Uh, that is where the Canadian Corps was at its very best. And he thought that victories that changed the course of the war, that won the war, were more important than a victory that had enormous morale uh, implications but that didn't affect the course of the war. Now, Curry, so far as I know, did not say where he would have preferred the Vimy Monument to be built instead of at Vimy. But my sense is that he would have thought the Canal du Nord was where it should be. That was, as I said, and I believe, the greatest victory the Canadians ever had. Uh, and that would have been a splendid place for a monument. On the other hand, Vimy's up on a ridge, it stands out, that monument is enormous, you can see it from about 40 miles away. It's a wondrous piece of uh, war memorialization. The greatest war memorial anywhere, in my view. Um, it's extraordinary that a small country like Canada would put up something like that in, a, in, in France. Perhaps it ought to have been at the Canal du Nord, but it probably, if it was there, it wouldn't have had the same grandeur that stands out over the countryside. So Curry wanted something else. We got, in his view, second best, but it's still pretty remarkable. Larry. You mentioned the, uh, the effect the uh, Navy victory had on the outcome of the war. If the Canadian attack had stalled, would anything really have changed in the long term? 
good question again. I don't know. The Americans were arriving uh, by the hundreds of thousands every month, coming in, in huge quantities, huge numbers. And there was no doubt that the Americans were going to be the decisive factor in, in deciding who would win the war. Uh, but they weren't there in large enough numbers then, in, the, in August to November. Uh, they weren't there in huge division numbers yet. They were relatively untrained, unblooded. Uh, they had to learn the hard way. They ended up having more casualties than the Canadians, but that was only because they didn't know how to do it as well when they got there. Uh, but the Germans knew that the Americans were going to be the decisive factor. That was why they launched their attacks in the spring of 1918, trying to seize a victory before enough Americans could be there to really turn the tables. By August 1918, the writing was on the wall for the Germans. The blockade, the economic blockade of Germany was having a huge impact. The Germans were starving. The German armies in the field, some of them were well equipped, others were hungry and ill-equipped. They still fought very well, but they were down to their last gasp. Would it have changed anything if the, if the Canadians had been defeated at Amiens or if they'd lost at uh, uh, the Drocourt-Cayant line? Probably not, in truth. But the point is that they weren't defeated, that they did win, that the victory in a, not a total sense, but in a substantial sense, was achieved by Canadians under Canadian command. Curry was correct when he said that his corps defeated 25% of the German army on the Western Front. Yes, there were others, of course. We left the rest to the others, he said. But it was the Canadians, four divisions, who defeated 47 divisions of the German army. Not all of them were first class. Some of them were. And 100,000 Canadians did their part in an, in an extraordinary way. I was in Wales, and um, I came across a, a cemetery in Wales, and it was compi uh, mostly Canadian soldiers from World War One. Do you have any so uh, information on a riot? I think it was a riot in Wales at the end of World War One. There was a riot in Wales at the end of World War One. And there certainly were Canadian casualties, but not a huge number. I did mention the riots yes, before. Yes. They were in Wales. Yes. And uh, there were casualties. Yes. But probably most of the Canadians in that cemetery were men who died of influenza, or men who died of wounds after being brought back to England, or men who were killed in motorcycle accidents, or men who died in automobile accidents, or any number of, of other things. There were some seven or 8,000 men who were killed in training accidents and and other other things, so it, there's lots of cemeteries full of full of Canadians who weren't killed in battle. Mm. One last question, I think, sir. Uh, I once read that this, the author I've forgotten his name, but he said that the in the First World War that the Germans fought for conquest, the British fought for king and country. Canadians, Australians, and New Zealanders fought for souvenirs. Is there anything to that? <laughs> um, the Canadians certainly liked their souvenirs. Um, there wasn't a prisoner taken who didn't get stripped searched for everything he had on him. His watch, his <laughs> wallet, his letters, uh, anything they could find. His medals in particular, his Lugers, his helmets. People wanted all of those things. But I don't think that men fight for king and country or even for souvenirs. I think men fight for the guy beside them. They fight for their friend who's in the next hole because he's all they have to count on. And they don't want to show that they're frightened if he doesn't look like he's frightened. And that's what motivates great regiments. It's what motivates men to fight, in my view. And I think that's probably the case. But if you can get souvenirs at the same time. <laughs> Thank you very much. This concludes today's webcast. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for listening. You can keep up with coming events at the RCMI by visiting our website at www.rcmi.org. We hope you'll tune in again, and we hope to see you in person at coming events.
Thank you and goodbye.